news. And I'm always trying to come up with a new jingle every now and then. But uh, uh, today I'm gonna I'm gonna do an op-ed and, and I'm gonna use some facts and some and some real real facts here. And this is my opinion, and I'm backing this opinion up by facts. And uh, and the reason I'm doing this opinion is because we have a lot of people that consider themselves um, experts in you know like our, our politicians and and uh, all these people that are coming up with all these all these new so-called new rules to uh, reform the policing in in the United States and the only reason they're doing that now is because they, they see it's a national outcry and that outcry is basically affecting the economy so they could care less about the people it's, but it's the money the dollars the dollars and cents is what they care about the most however uh this thing i'm gonna i'm gonna probably break it down into two two videos because it's gonna go pretty long so i might i might break this down into two videos so this is part one and uh and so my theory is, is it's a four-part theory it, it deals with uh cops the cops that are out there in, in the United States and how they are hired it's the first part um, then the, the reason why they're hired and then the uh, then you then you talk about the incarceration rates and then you talk about the people that are that have mental issues that are log that are basically lumped in with uh, the so-called criminals and then you're talking about the prison industrial complex, which is the final, the final piece of that puzzle. So it's a lot of different pieces that you got to put together. And the first piece that, uh, as as my opinion is, that what the, what what's been going on in the United States basically since um, probably before, but but I've I've noticed since the first Gulf War that happened in the 90s. Uh, you had the guys when they went to Iraq and you had uh, these military guys that went to Iraq and when they you know they they were teaching them like a, a different type of warfare and uh, which eventually progressed into like an urban warfare environment so these guys are trained in urban warfare and they have uh, served active duty in places like Iraq and Afghanistan uh, and then when they come back to the United States it's like okay so now you want to give them jobs uh, immediately give them jobs as soon as they leave the service all the time they've been over in Afghanistan and Iraq killing killing and that's their that's what they were sent there to do was they were sent there to kill and now you bring those same people back and you put them in uniforms and you and you put them on the streets but predominantly those ones that you put on the streets are going directly to the uh, uh, the minority neighborhoods. So they still have that killer mentality from being from the active duty, and they haven't been given enough time to basically get all of that stuff out of their system. And then I really don't know if that's even possible for a person to actually get all of that murder and all of that killing out of their systems. However, I'm thinking that if it's a possibility, if they took, uh, made them, gave them a, a period of maybe five years, you know, four or five years to get some of the help that they need to get themselves back in order mentally before you put a uniform and get that person a badge and a gun and you point them in the direction of a person and that person still has that mentality of, fighting the enemy so this is where i'm going with it so now you have a person that's in that's in the, in the military you bring him home you put him in a uniform and then you turn him loose on the minority neighborhoods and then you ask the question i wonder why the cops are shooting so many people duh they, they shooting they're doing it because they they still have that mentality of us against them this is a war and this is and this is this is how they even classify it war on drugs so they still have that war mentality when you put those badges on them and you turn them loose on the minority communities so then here's another part that 
nobody ever thinks about, and it's the PD, uh, PTSD uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans. And uh, so the post-traumatic post stress, uh, stress disorder and anger are common in Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans. In fact, Iraq and Afghanistan veterans are at risk for a number of mental health problems. Studies have consistently shown that veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan wars exhibit high rates of PTSD, depression, uh, and substance, substance abuse, and uh, uh, use disorders. A group of researchers looked at the rates of PTSD and anger problems among a group of 117 Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans. Similar to other reports of veterans they studied exhibited high rates of PTSD. In fact, about 40% had PTSD and an additional 18% almost had a PTSD diagnosis or what is often re referred to as a, a sub-threshold PTSD. They are struggling with some severe symptoms of PTSD, but not quite enough symptoms to meet the criteria for a full PTSD diagnosis. In addition, over half the veterans in, in, indicated they have been aggressive in the past four months, such as threatening physical violence, destroying property, or having a physical fight with someone. Veterans experience uh, sub-threshold PTSD reported just about the same amount of aggressive behavior as a veterans diagnosed with PTSD. Veterans with PTSD and with almost uh, PT PTSD diagnosis were much more likely to be aggressive than those veterans without PTSD. Anger may also be a way of trying to express or release tension connected to uncomfortable emotions often associated with PTSD, such as shame and guilt. In dealing with anger, Individuals with PTSD more, uh, uh, may be more likely to have problems controlling anger, and this study shows that problems with anger may occur soon after returning from combat. Anger can be a, a very different and difficult emotion to deal with and can lead to a number of legal and interpersonal problems such as domestic violence. There are, however, a number of ways to manage anger. First, addressing the symptoms of PTSD through therapy may also help reduce feelings of anger. Uh, many treatments for PTSD even incorporate anger management skills. Learning more effective ways of coping with stress may also be helpful in managing anger and aggressive behavior. Some coping skills that may, uh, may be particularly helpful are deep breathing, mindfulness, taking time outs, and identifying the short and long-term negative and positive consequences of different behavior. So listen to what I said before, PTSD, Iraq, Afghanistan, war veterans, some of those pre-PTSD pre uh, people that fall right under, under the guidelines, the guidelines are, they fall right under the guidelines, so they're not really completely diagnosed as being PTSD, badge, cop gun. So you turn in PTSD affected uh, Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans loose on the streets with these badges and guns. and uh, But you still ask the same question. I wonder why the cops are being so aggressive and why they are doing some of the things that they do on the streets. They got issues. They got a lot of issues that they, that they should have worked out prior to getting those badges. They never should have been able to get a badge prior to going through these these courses and trying to get get their minds right so then you're going to go into part two here and it's the uh, racial disparity disparity in sentencing and um, the history of racial disparity in, in the criminal justice system in the united states have been long standing the racial dynamics and sentencing have changed over time and reflect a move to uh, from explicit racism to more uh, more uh, manifestations and outcomes. And uh, so basically, here's a direct racial discrimination. Key findings had evidence of direct racial discrimination against my minority defendants in sentencing outcomes. Evidence of direct discrimination at the federal level is even is more prominent than at the state level. Blacks are more likely to be uh, disadvantaged in terms of sentence length and federal level 
whereas Latinos are more likely to be disadvantaged in terms of the decision to incarcerate. At the state level, both Latinos and, bl and blacks are far more likely to be disadvantaged in a decision to incarcerate or not, as opposed to the decision regarding sentence length. Interactions of uh, race, eth ethnicity uh, with the other offender characteristics. Key findings, young black and Latino males tend to be sentenced more severely than comparably situated white males with the same, that have done and committed the same crimes. Unemployed black males tend to be sentenced more severely than comparably uh, situated whites that are unemployed. Blacks pay a higher trial penalty than comparably situated whites. Whites receive a larger reduction in sentence time than blacks and Latinos for providing a substantial assistance to the prosecution. So that means if they turn state's evidence, then they get a chance to get off completely compared to blacks and Latinos if they help help uh, in assistance in the prosecution, help the prosecution, then it, it's like, okay, we're just gonna cut your time down by a couple of years, but you're still gonna do some time. Blacks and, and Latinos with the more serious criminal record tend to be sentenced more severely than comparably situated whites. Blacks are more likely to be jailed pending trial and therefore tend to receive harsher sentences. Whites are more likely to hire a private attorney than blacks uh, or Latinos and therefore receive a less severe sentence. Black defendants who victimize whites tend to receive more severe sentences than uh, both blacks who victimize other blacks and whites who victimize whites. Latinos and blacks tend to be sentenced more harshly than whites for lower level crimes such as drug crimes and property crimes. However, Latinos and blacks convicted of high level drug offenses also tend to be more harshly sentenced than similarly situated whites. Capital punishment. In vast majority of states, the race of the victim tends to have an effect on the sentence outcome with white victims cases more often resulting in death sentences. However, in some jurisdictions, notably on the federal system, the race of the defendant also affects sentencing outcomes with minority defendants more likely to receive a death sentence than white defendants. So these are the disparities, the disparities and the things as far as the sentencing goes. So I'm gonna this is I'm gonna end this part. This is part one. I'm gonna end this part one and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna pick it back up on part two.